right, good evening. We want our choir to make their way up. If you'd like to come and help us do that and make your way right into the choir loft, and then in a moment we're going to stand together and sing together. Uh, but we want to welcome you to our service this evening. God bless you for coming here. It's a great, been a great day and a special night. And uh, we're honored and we're thankful you're with us here this evening. <laughs> find hymn number 245. There should be one right close enough for you to grab it. And uh, if you will, stand together. We want to begin our service tonight by just singing this old hymn together, Heavenly Sunlight. And we'll sing all three verses of it. And uh, we're thankful tonight that we're able to be here and for God's goodness. And uh, we'll sing it together as we begin our service. to be here. Our children that are here, they're going to be uh, going and working on their Easter program in a little bit. And uh, all of the, our preschool and elementary school age children are welcome to be a part of our program. And uh, they are going to be rehearsing now on Sunday evenings as we move toward Easter. And uh, so they'll, uh, they'll be working hard and we can't wait to see their program. Our adult choir began uh, rehearsing a week or so ago and they're practicing now at 5 p.m. on Sunday evenings and we invite you to come out and be a part of that. And uh, tonight's a special night because we're going to have a baptizing here in a little bit. And uh, Hannon and Taylor are going to follow the Lord in Believer's Baptism. And we're excited for them and thankful for the young families, young moms and dads that want to serve the Lord, want to make a difference. And I'm excited and thankful for them. They're here in our church. And uh, so it's just a great place to be. And we're welcoming all of our guests and visitors. And uh, I know a lot of you are family, but some of you are old friends of ours too. And so we're glad you're here. And God bless you for coming out. We're going to pray together and we'll just look to the Lord here. Lord, we thank you for being good to us and we thank you for a great day. Uh, Lord, we thank you and we rejoice that, God, uh, we have sunlight, S O N light from heaven the light of life and truth, and that, Lord, we can walk in that light and in fellowship with that light. And so, Lord, we thank you for what we have in Jesus Christ alone. We pray tonight now your blessings on everything that's done and said. Uh, thank you for the music we've had that's honored the Lord. It's been Christ-honoring music and the choir, and, Lord, we thank you for them. We ask you, Lord, to use them tonight just to cause our hearts to be open to you and to your word and to worshiping you in spirit and in truth. 
And uh, Lord, we thank you for uh, Hannon and Taylor, uh, Lord, their desire to follow you in believers' baptism, Lord, to have a Christian scriptural home and to raise their children, Lord, to know you and want to make a difference in this world. And we just pray and thank you for all of our families in our church. We ask you to keep your hand on them and hedge them in. Thank you for folks visiting tonight. And Lord, we pray you just give direction and speak to our hearts tonight in all that you do, and we want you to be honored. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Our choir is going to sing a couple special songs for us here this evening.
make their way down, find a place to sit. So why don't you stand for a moment and just turn around and fellowship with someone. Tell them you're glad they made it to church tonight. It's a joy to see them. And uh, we are thankful for you uh, being with us tonight. to be and wonderful to fellowship tonight and we're just thankful for God's goodness uh, with uh, all of our hearts and lives here this evening and uh, if you're here and you're visiting with us maybe in a service like this for the very first time then we're honored you're here we hope you'll come back and be with us just as soon as you possibly can and uh, uh, we're just excited and thankful for what God is doing here and uh, in our hearts and lives. So thank you for coming out and being a part of tonight's services. And uh, we uh, uh, probably uh, had uh, a few of the slides and announcements rolling up there before the services that you got to catch, but don't forget about some of those things that are coming up, our rehearsals for choir and for our Easter program are uh, continuing now on Sunday evenings. And uh, we've got ladies' Bible study coming up here toward the end of the month, and all of our ladies are invited to that. And uh, we also uh, have uh, 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 other uh, things that you'll notice there if you got a copy of the bulletin, and uh, you can take a look at that and see some of the other things coming up on the calendar. But we are glad and thankful for you being able to come out and be with us here on uh, Sunday evening on a special night. Uh, God bless you for being here. Uh, on Sunday evenings during this time in the service, we ask our men to come and help us and we receive our church tithes and our offerings and our mission offerings. And uh, we, uh, we're uh, worshiping the Lord, giving and investing in God's work and furthering the work of the Lord in the local church. 
through our giving, and uh, we do, uh, ha we did make uh, a need known about some maintenance on one of our vans, just getting some things taken care of and some things that we needed to do. And if you'd like to do something special for the van, then just mark that on one of the offering envelopes in the pew. Just mark it or mark it on your check or whatever you are doing and just make that for the van and we'll be sure uh, to put that aside for that. But our men will pray and lead us in prayer and we'll receive our offerings tonight. <coughs> offering and uh, we use that change offering for our summer camp for boys and girls the first full week of June we take all the boys and girls second grade through the 12th grade that would like to go uh, somewhere around 80 or 100 of them every summer and we go to summer camp and we spend the whole week and uh, boy we just have a great time and we eat good and have a lot of good fun and games and just a memorable week and so for some of the children that get to go to church camp that's, uh, that's their vacation. That's the highlight of their summer. And uh, we are able to do that because you faithfully give. And uh, so we receive a change offering. And uh, a little different than what we normally do. But if you went out to lunch today, all you probably got back was a little bit of change. So there's no need to take that home with you. You might as well just give it toward church camp. So like, we're going uh, to receive that offering. But what makes it so special is we use all the preschool and elementary age children in our Sunday evening services to receive that offering. And they do a good job and they help us out. And we're blessed and thankful for families who come out and bring their children on a Sunday night. So our boys and girls are going to come over and give us a hand. And uh, they're going to get a, uh, an official uh church camp offering taking up cup and uh, we're going to receive that offering how are you adrian good buddy all right come on over here we're going to we're going to pray together now before we receive our offering okay so come on and give us a hand and uh, grab a cup victor's got a couple more over here for these boys and uh, we're going to pray together and we're going to thank the lord and uh, god wants us to be thankful people and he wants us to realize that every good thing we ever experience comes from him and so our week at church camp is going to be because God's good to us and uh, because God's people give and invest in the lives of children. So let's pray together and then we'll get you to help us take up our offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being good to us tonight. We thank you for your grace, mercy, and goodness and the gift you gave us of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, you've truly set the example of giving. And so, Lord, we just pray tonight we'll just invest in the lives of these children and invest in our uh, in our church camp and meeting the needs that we'll have when it comes time for that. Now, Lord, we just pray you'll bless these boys and girls. We're praying every one of them will come to know you as their Lord and Savior. Know what a joy it is to live for you and serve you. And so, Father, we are thankful tonight. We ask your blessings on the offering. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you have some offering, keep your hand up high until they come by and get it, okay? And uh, then they'll, they'll bring it up here and they'll put it in the cup for you.
Amen. Thank you, boys and girls, and we appreciate your help, and we couldn't do that without you on a Sunday night, and some of these uh, boys and girls are going to be great ushers someday, aren't they? They're ushers in training, and especially the ones, if they don't think you gave enough, they just don't leave. They just stay right there looking right at you, isn't it? They look you right in the eye and say, is that all you got? Come on. And uh, so I'm going to keep them in the pipeline. We're going to use them later on, and and uh, they're doing a great job, though. We're thankful for them, uh, every one of them. What great potential if they just give their heart and life to Jesus Christ, won't they? And so we're trying to help reach them. And we're thankful for parents and families here tonight. And I know Hannon and Taylor's got a lot of family and friends here. And, and I won't put you on the spot by making you introduce everybody. But we're glad they're here. And, uh, and we're thankful to see folks here. Gene and Mary, it's great to have you here tonight. Bill and Carol, wonderful to have you with us. And, Good to have the Nelsons, one of our families from daycare here together with us tonight, and, and just a blessing, and we're thankful for everyone being in your place on a Sunday night, and uh, we're just excited about what God's doing. And uh, just a little bit now, we're going to go ahead and, uh, and be able to do something that, that the true New Testament local church has been doing for 2,000 years, just like the Lord said we should, and uh, so we're excited and thankful about that. But if you have your Bible tonight for just a few moments, I'd like for you to look into God's Word with me. And uh, I know and knew and the Lord's had on my heart uh, about tonight and knowing that we were going to have uh, uh, the ordinance of baptism. And uh, so on my heart uh, as a pastor, I, I have just some truth I'd like to share just to kind of lay a foundation, uh, not just for Hannon and Taylor, but for all of us and just as a remembrance of some things that uh, we understand to be true about the church, and we're preaching a series of messages on the, the church, the pillar and ground of the truth, and uh, our theme for this year is standing on the truth in 2017, and so all of our ministries and messages and teaching and preaching all throughout the year are centered on that thought or that theme, and so we're talking about the pillar and ground of truth. Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and he said that the church is the pillar and ground of truth in the world. That means it is the foundation of and it holds up all truth that's in the world. And uh, we're thankful for the word of God. And I'd like for you to take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 2. And we're going to read a few verses of scripture here. And I want to speak for just a moment on membership in the local New Testament church. Membership in the local New Testament church. We've already... We've already taken action on Hannon and Taylor. Our church took them in under the watch care of our church. And, uh, and, and until baptism, uh, and then after baptism, they become united with this church. They become a part of this body, and they've already been here physically. But, but in a biblical, scriptural sense, they become a real body, a real part of our body here at this local church. And we're thankful for them. Uh, but we want to look at what the Bible has to say about this and some other things. But notice in Acts chapter 2, Acts is the book of the Acts of the Holy Spirit of God through the first century church. This is what we have in Acts, the first century church. And uh, we see it in action as the Spirit of God uses it. And uh, we pick up this reading in Acts 2 for verse 41 after Peter has been used of God to stand publicly in Jerusalem and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and in an open-air meeting, 3,000 people received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. That was a great meeting, wasn't it? And now the Bible talks about what happened after people got saved because there's an after salvation. There's some things we need, to, we need to know as far as growing and moving forward in our Christian life now that we're saved and born again. And we see some of these things. Acts 2, verse 41, the Bible says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were, were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should 
be saved. So what a great picture of what was happening in the first century church. You know, we in this century, the 21st century, instead of trying to be the newest thing down the pike or something that takes the 21st century by storm, it ought to be our goal to be a first century church, shouldn't it? That's what our goal ought to be, to be just like the church we find in the book of Acts. And so uh, we want to look tonight at some of the truths we find here uh, from God's Word. Let's pray together once again. Lord, thank you for this great night. Thank you for those little boys and girls. And Lord, we pray that we can reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray and thank you for families that are here tonight. Thank you for a family that God uh, sees the significance of a night like tonight and come out to see uh, God, their loved ones, uh, growing in the Lord and and, 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 Lord, doing those things that please and honor you and setting a good example for their children, their daughters. And so, Lord, thank you for that family that's here tonight. We ask you to minister to those visiting and others, Lord, in our services. Help us to grow and help us to see that, Lord, in the local church we have a foundation for our hearts and homes and we can stand upon the truth that we have in God's Word. And, Lord, speak to our hearts tonight about the church and about being a part of the church and how precious and a and how, uh, Lord, important those things are. And so we just look to you and ask these things in your name. Someone may have come to church tonight, Lord, but has never come to Jesus Christ. And Lord, uh, we pray tonight that your word and the, and, the, and the work of the Spirit of God would bring them to a place of recognition and repentance and salvation. And for all of us as your people, God, we grow when we obey. So help us to grow tonight through obedience to your word. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name we pray. And amen. Amen. You know, when we live in a day like we live in today, one of the most misunderstood and, and confusing of topics is that of the church because there's so, so many things out there today, aren't there, that say we are a church or this is a church. And uh, when we look at it, it can be confusing and sometimes it's misunderstand. Uh, there can be some misunderstanding about the church. Uh, what is the church? Is there a true church? Is there you know, significance to a denomination or uh, in common vernacular uh, is one brand of church better than the other. These are all things people think about and they, they look at all the options and, you know, they're trying to, trying to figure out what is it that is right for me and my family. Well, listen, I want to encourage you today that in all things, in all things, uh, especially the people of God, we should be biblical people, shouldn't we? We should be biblical people. In uh, other words, we should, we should want to look to the Word of God, the Bible, as the fixed reference point for truth. If I want to know truth about whatever it may be, then I want to seek the Scriptures. I want to search the Scriptures. The Bible says that we ought to search the Scriptures, for in them we find eternal life. If I want to know the truth about salvation, about having my sin forgiven, about knowing I have a home in heaven, then I need to go to the Word of God, don't I? And that's where we find the, uh, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We find what He did, and we find what uh, God did in giving us His Son, Jesus Christ, and how we can be saved. So as God's people, we should examine all things through the light of God's Word. And when we must, uh, uh, then we must decide we're going to stand where God stands, on whatever issue there may be. And we know we're living in a world where issues uh, are divisive, aren't they? I mean, they, they're drawing lines and people are stepping across lines and people who were on one side are going over to the other side and so many different things are happening in the world we live in. But as God's people, we have a fixed point of reference for truth and we ought to find out what God's Word says about the issues of life and in our world and society. And then when we see it, we ought to choose to stand where God stands and not move away from that truth. Just stand on the truth. And that's what we want to try to do here in 2017. I encourage you as God's people to be a biblical individual. Have a scriptural home. You parents, moms and dads, just decide. No matter what's popular on Pinterest or whatever else is going on in the world, uh, I'm going to have a scriptural home. I'm going to order up my home according to the Word of God. I'm going to seek the truth of God's Word and stand on it in love and compassion in this world in which I live. One of the most obvious characteristics of the true New Testament church we see, among many others here in Acts chapter 2, 
And that's, that, that, that characteristic is the church's uh, obedience to the Word of God. Uh, they were an obedient church. Notice the Bible said again there in verse 41, Then they that gladly received His Word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They, they stayed right in the Word of God. They stayed right with the truth of God's Word in the Scriptures. And we too today must strive to be like that first century church and that we use God's Word as our standard and, uh, and, and we use it as the template for what we ought to do and how we ought to be as we live our lives in this world. In Ephesians chapter 5, you find one of the great uh, insights into the heart of Jesus Christ on the subject of the church. The church. How, how does the Lord Jesus feel about the church? What matter of importance does He place on it? Well, in Ephesians 5, He's giving uh, some illustrations to the family. And the family here, He mentions wives and husbands and parents and children in Acts 5 and Acts, or in Ephesians 5 and Ephesians chapter 6. But notice this beginning in verse 25 of Ephesians 5. He said, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church. See, we as men of God are to love our wives with the same love that Jesus Christ demonstrated in His love for the church. And he loves the church. He loves the church. Because the Bible said he gave himself for it, didn't he? He gave himself for it. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So right here, men, I have a, a place to stand. I have a biblical foundation from which I move forward and by which I measure my love for my wife and family by that which we have of Christ loving and giving himself for the church. And he wants that church, he says in verse 26 of Ephesians 5, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word and that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And so the Lord Jesus loves the church and he's given us his word so that we as a local church might stand on and stay in the truth so that someday when he returns and we go to be with him, we do not have to be ashamed to stand before him. And uh, so he loves the church. And so I want you to think about just some simple things this evening we see uh, in God's word about the church. Number one, I want you just to write this down, the pattern for the church. The pattern for a church. Some of you may sew or uh, you may work in woodwork or whatever, and you have a pattern. I know some of you men do that, and some of the ladies sew, and, and you have a pattern, and you lay that pattern out, and you either pin it and cut it out, or you draw it on and cut out around it, or you have a pattern or a template for, for what you're building or making or doing. You know, uh, we have a pattern for the New Testament church from God's Word itself. We, we see it in the Scriptures and then we should desire to be sure that we fit the pattern, not try to make the pattern fit who and what we are. Uh, we're to fit to the pattern or the template. You know, what, not one time in all the Bible does the Word of God refer to the church as a national church, the church of Israel. He, you know, you never find that in the Bible. And uh, we know that uh, in some nations in the world, there's national churches. You go to England and they have the, the Anglican church. That's the national official church of the whole country. But we never find anything like that in the pattern for the church in the New Testament scriptures. Uh, we find that, uh, that there is a true New Testament local church. And the Bible helps us to identify it and helps us to show some things about it. If you want to write this down, number one, uh, the, church, the church itself, it means a called out assembly. The word church, it means a called out assembly. A group of people uh, are called out and come together and, and come apart from uh, the whole. Uh, in Matthew 16, uh, Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he's about to share with them the great truth of how he's come to build the church, to establish the church. And he said to them in, in verse 15 of Matthew 16, he saith to them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And here we have one of the great foundational truths in the Bible, that the church, the true New Testament local church, was established by Jesus Christ himself, upon himself, and that he is the builder of the church. Now, we weren't there the day he said this, and so we have to use our spiritual imagination, uh, but we know that there are some denominations in the world that would have you believe today that the church started on Peter, that Peter is the foundation of the church, Peter is the head of the church, but that's not so, that's not true. And if we were there that day, I think we would have seen this. Peter was there standing before the Lord, and you remember Jesus changed his name. It was Simon, but he started calling him Peter. And the word Peter means a little pebble. It means just a little stone or a little rock that you might scoop down on the, uh, uh, in the ground and pick up and have several in your hand at one time. And, and Peter's standing there and all the disciples, and we have to see it. The Lord is speaking to Peter. He, said, he, he says here in this passage of Scripture in verse number 18, uh, Thou art Peter. You're a little stone, Peter. And you're going to have a part to play, but upon this rock he would have done. He would have done that. Upon this rock myself, I'll build my church. Peter, you're a part of this. And all you other disciples, you'll be a part, but I'm building the church on the rock of my foundation. On my death, burial, and resurrection, uh, I will build my church. And so the Lord Jesus uh, began building His church. The true New Testament church belongs to Jesus Christ. It is His church. Uh, he paid the price to establish it. He does the building of the church. He's given us a blueprint or a pattern for the church in the New Testament Scriptures. And we want to try to align ourselves with that pattern as much as we possibly can. So the church is a called out assembly. We believe this also. Secondly, uh, it started with Jesus Christ, the church, and was empowered at Pentecost. Uh, he started the church while he was here in this world. You read the gospel records and often the things that he teaches and preaches about and the illustrations he gives to some of the parables, they apply to the local New Testament church. For instance, he taught about church discipline, didn't he? He taught about uh, how and what we're to do if there's disagreements among the brethren, how we're to handle that. He did that thinking about the church, how we are to handle that in the church. So while the Lord was alive, uh, he began to establish the church and he began to teach the church uh, its polity or its, its way that it should operate. And then on the day of Pentecost, he empowered it to go forward and do the work of God in the world. Do you remember when he ascended back into heaven? He told the church, now you go and wait in Jerusalem and wait for the promise that I'm giving you of the coming of the Spirit of God. And when the Spirit of God comes, and when He indwells you and empowers you, then go forward and begin to fulfill my work and to accomplish the work of the Great Commission. So He called out a church. Jesus Christ established it. It was empowered on Pentecost. And then we believe Jesus Christ is the only head of the church. He's the only head. In Colossians chapter 1, the Bible says in verse 18, speaking about the Lord Jesus, and He, Jesus, is the head of the body, the church. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Pretty straightforward. He's the head. He's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning. The Lord Jesus is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. You know who ought to be the preeminent person in your local church? Not your pastor, not the special singing, uh, not uh, anyone else, not a deacon, not anyone. It ought to be the Lord Jesus, isn't it? He should have the preeminence. He should be preeminent in everything. And He's the head of the church. Uh, Jesus Christ uh, is the head. Uh, the head has a special role on your uh, body. <laughs> because most of us do not walk backwards. We, we know the direction we're facing. Whichever way our head turns, the rest of us follow. 
And that's the way it should be, and that's the way it is with the Lord. He's the head, and we're to follow Him. The Lord Jesus gave to the church physically in this world a shepherd, a pastor, and He leads the church as, as He follows Jesus Christ Himself. But the Lord Jesus established the church. He empowered it at Pentecost. He's the head of the church. The church, uh, as we see them in the New Testament, are independent congregations. They're independent congregations. <clears throat> you see a distinct local New Testament church in the New Testament. You know, you know what all of these books that we have, the titles of these books in the Bible, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians. Do you know what, what or where those names came from? I mean, why choose those names as the books of the Bible? Why not call them something else? Well, those are, those are literal cities that were in the first century. There was, a, there was a city called Rome. That was the capital of the world. There was a city called Corinth. There was a city called Galatia. There was a city called Colossae. There was a city called Ephesus. There was a city called Thessalonica. And in those individual cities, there was local, independent, New Testament, Bible-preaching churches. And he sent letters to them in unique ways. Those churches were unique. They were their own assemblies and they had their own issues and problems and he sent them letters uh, to instruct them and to guide them and lead them and now collectively in the Word of God we now as a local church right here we can have the benefit of all of those words that he gave to all of those other independent churches but that's the way the Lord dealt with those churches. He recognized them as independent and he recognized them as unique and so uh, we believe the local church uh, was started with Christ, empowered at Pentecost, uh, that He is the only head, that they were independent local New Testament churches. And then we believe that the church has the sole responsibility of reaching the lost world with the gospel. Pastor, who has the responsibility of reaching 7 billion lost people on planet earth with the gospel? Is that something we ought to see if we can put politicians in place and they can develop some government program and we can try to uh, fund that uh, through our government and get this work done? No, no, he gave the greatest work in the world reaching the lost to the local church, didn't he? He gave it to the church. He didn't give it to any organization or parabiblical organization. He gave it to the local church. In Acts chapter 1, he says in verse 8, But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. His last words he said before he left to the church that was there gathered around him that day was, You have the, the purpose now. Uh, my, my reason for coming, I am now passing along to you. Uh, it is your commission to go and reach a lost world for Jesus Christ. And so uh, we believe this to be true about the church. So the church was established by Christ, empowered at Pentecost. He's the only head. They were independent congregations just like we have here. Uh, he gave the church uh, the, uh, the sole responsibility of reaching the lost. And then we believe, as we said earlier, the church is the pillar and ground of truth. The pillar and ground of truth. Standing on the truth. Our foundation is on the truth uh, for us and for those who follow after us. And so we must stand on the truth. And we find that passage of Scripture in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now, we believe the Bible teaches that the New Testament church, the one we find in the Bible, the one that's patterned for us, was baptistic in doctrine. You say, Pastor, why do you call the church there? Why did they establish this church and, and put the name Tri-State Baptist Temple? Why did they do that? The Baptist part, Pastor, what does that mean? Does that mean it's a part of a denomination? Or does it mean it's a, an association of other things? Or what does that mean? No, the idea of Baptist in the name of our church is a doctrinal thing, not a denominational thing. We believe the Bible teaches that the local New Testament church is Baptistic in their doctrine. And you say, well, how, can you, how do you arrive at that conclusion? Well, I have a very simple little way uh, that I do that. I like to share it with you. It's called an acrostic. Do you, you know what that is? I like to play games and puzzles. And you take the word Baptist, and if you want to do it on a piece of paper, you can do it. You can write it down, B-A-P-T-I-S-T-S. -S. Just write down the word Baptist. And then I'm going to give you a word 
beginning with the first letter, uh, and, and it will be in the word Baptist, and it'll show you from the Scripture why we believe a local New Testament church is Baptistic in doctrine. Uh, look at the first thought. We believe in the biblical authority of the church. The biblical authority. That's the B in Baptist. Biblical authority. We believe the Word of God is our final authority for our church. We, we don't believe there's anything outside of the Scriptures that usurps or takes precedence over the Bible for us as a local church. There's no group of people meeting somewhere who are going to discuss whether or not we ought to keep believing that the blood of Christ is essential for salvation. We're not going to, uh, we're not going to uh, uh, change our view on that because a group of people decide that's no longer relevant today. You know what? That's happening all across our country in churches and denominations. We're not going to suddenly uh, come back from the national conference and the, our representatives say, well, you know what? We've decided we don't really believe in the inspiration of the Scriptures anymore. Uh, we, we, we believe it's a good book and a guide, but we don't believe or know that it's God's Word. We're not going to allow someone else to make that choice or decision for us. We believe in the biblical authority of the church, nothing else. Nothing else is, has authority or usurps authority over us. God's Word is our final authority, and so we look to it. That's the B. The A stands for the autonomy of the congregation. The autonomy, that's a fancy word, but I had to come up with something to go with the A, right? i got to make this work. But autonomy means independence. It means the ability to stand on its own two feet. Our local church is an independent local New Testament church, like we believe the ones in the Scripture were. And uh, so, uh, so we have Christ as our head. We have God's Word as our authority. Uh, the P in Baptist stands for the priesthood of every believer. Now, don't be nervous about me using the word priest or priesthood because what that simply means is that uh, I have access directly to the throne of God through my living mediator, Jesus Christ. I don't have to go and find someone and tell them uh, what I'm praying about or ask them to, uh, to, to get me into the presence of God because I can't do it myself. No, we believe that each of us are able to go to the Lord in prayer through the new and living way, which is the resurrected Jesus Christ, seated by the right hand of God, who is our advocate and mediator. I can pray standing up, sitting down, uh, with my eyes open, uh, with them closed, driving down the road in my car, but not with my eyes closed, right? I can pray anytime, day or night, anywhere I want to be. I don't have to come to church. I don't have to be in a room. I, I can be outside. I can pray because Christ lives in me and He's living and He's seated by God the Father and He said we are to pray and whatsoever you pray, ask it in my name. And so we believe in the priesthood of believers. This is what the P stands for. So, so we have biblical authority, autonomy of the congregation, the priesthood of believers. The T stands for two church officers. When you look at the New Testament and read the Bible, there are only two offices that are mentioned being a part of the New Testament local church. They are, number one, the pastor, and number two, a deacon. That's all you find. There are no bishops, cardinals, uh, no other types of offices or terminology used. Uh, to, 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 to describe the two offices that we have in the local New Testament church. You only find the two, but uh, the word bishop, the word elder, the word pastor, the word shepherd, those are all interchangeable words for your pastor, for the leader of the church following the Lord Jesus. So, uh, so biblical authority, autonomy of the congregation, the priesthood of every believer, two church offices. The I in Baptist stands for individual soul liberty. We believe the Bible teaches that each of us as individual beings are responsible for what we do with the truth of Jesus Christ. We're, we're responsible for what we do in response to the gospel of Jesus Christ, to the truth that God's Word says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now that I know that, I am responsible for what I do with that. And I am personally responsible for receiving Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I can't rely upon anyone else to do that. I wish I could do it for other people, but I cannot. You must. And by the way, you can't do it for your children or your grandchildren. 
They must do it for themselves. So that's why it's important to be sure you have your children under the sound of God's Word faithfully, that it's in your home, that it's in your heart, it's a part of your life and world, so that they become uh, a, 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 you know, knowledgeable of the fact that they're lost, they need a Savior, just like Jesus Christ, and uh, just like you did. And uh, so uh, we need Him as our Savior. So uh, tonight, when we baptize Hannon and Taylor, uh, we'll, we'll say it this way. We'll say, uh, we'll say, Hannon, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Only because he has individually received Jesus Christ as his own personal Savior. And so we believe in that uh, independence of the, of the, of the soul. Uh, we don't believe that some, uh, we don't believe the Bible teaches some souls are destined for an eternity without God and some are destined for an eternity with God. We believe every individual soul is responsible for themselves. Christ died for all sinners, didn't he? He died for all. The S, the first S in Baptist stands for a saved church membership. I just mentioned that. The members of a local New Testament church are saved. They've received the gospel of Jesus Christ. Acts 2.41, you remember the verse I read to you? And uh, the Bible said, And they, they that gladly received his word were baptized. Now, let me ask you, what happened first? They heard the gospel and they gladly received it, didn't they? They realized we're sinners lost without Christ. If we don't receive the gospel, we're lost. And they received it gladly. And if you're here tonight and you've never trusted Christ as your personal Savior, listen, there's no greater need in your life. No greater need. We're born lost without Christ, separated from Him. If we live all our life and die, we'll enter eternity lost and separated from Him. And there's no turning back. There's no going back. What we do here makes the difference then. And so we ought to gladly receive Christ because we can and because He has given us the opportunity to be saved. And so, uh, so we want to receive Him as our Savior. Save church membership. We don't have any unsaved members in our church. They've all, uh, they've all trusted Christ as their Savior. The second T in Baptist stands for two ordinances. We believe there are two offices, pastor and deacon, and there are two ordinances. An ordinance is an order that Jesus Christ gave the church something that we should do. One of them is called the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper. We observe it here every fifth Sunday evening. That's not a, a, a written down in stone rule. You can do it more. You can do it less. But the thing is, we are commanded to observe the Lord's Supper, which sets forth for us the illustration that Christ in His own body died for me on the cross with my sin debt, and through the shedding of His blood, there is remission and forgiveness of sins. And the Bible said we're to do it as a church until He comes again. Keep lifting Him up as the only Savior. And so we believe in the two ordinances. And then the S, the S is the separation of church and state. We believe that. But see, the world is confused about that. They think the church has no place in state government or federal government. That's not what that meant at all. It meant the government has no place in your church. Messing around, meddling in your church, telling your preacher what he can and cannot preach. Uh, revoking your, uh, you know, uh, your, your uh, non-tax status. Uh, they don't have that right. But the Bible, Christ, the Word of God has every right in every building in Washington, D.C. And that's the way our forefathers wanted it to be. That's the way he established it to be. And that's the way it ought to be. We can't put on and off our Christianity and whether you're a public civil servant elected to a public office or not, if you're a born-again believer, you ought to be a born-again believer, whether you're a senator or representative, president or whatever else you are, school board or whatever, uh, you are a child of God and a believer, and that's the way we should be. But we believe the government, the state, has no right meddling in the work of God or in the local church. That's what we mean by that. That's what they meant by that, separation of church and state. But see, we've got it all backwards, don't we? We have it backwards, the Baptist. So we believe uh, then that the local church is Baptistic in our doctrine. Baptistic in our doctrine. We see these things in the New Testament. So the local church was established by the Lord Jesus, empowered at Pentecost. He's the head 
uh, we believe uh, in the uh, in the uh, uh, the independence of the congregation. Uh, we believe we're Baptistic in doctrine, a pillar and ground of the church. We believe that the local church, as we mentioned, has a born again, baptized membership, and uh, we see it there in Acts two, verse forty one. So the pattern of the church. Now, let me just quickly mention this: the people in a church, the people in a church. Many people today think that membership and unity or faithfulness in a local New Testament church is unimportant. They feel like that's unimportant. Uh, but when we look to God's Word, we see how important it was in the first century. You look at a man like the Apostle Paul, one of the great Bible preachers and Christians who ever lived. And in Acts 9.26, the Bible said what was, what was the desire of Paul, Saul then, Right after he got saved. Acts 9.26 says, And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. When he was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself. Pastor, what does that mean? That means he got saved on the road to Damascus, but he knew that the church, that first century church, was meeting in Jerusalem. So he went to the church there in Jerusalem and he wanted to join. He wanted to become a member. To join uh, he is said to join them. The word join means to glue together. It mean, can't, means to become a part of. It means to become inseparable with. And this is what Paul wanted to do, uh, knowing the, the importance of the local church. In Acts 4.23, those, those preachers had been persecuted and they had been jailed for preaching the gospel of Christ. And some of them were able to be released. And Acts 4.23 said, And being let go, they went to their own company. Their own company. In other words, uh, here's, here's a group, an assembly of people in which they belonged. That was their own company. And they, uh, and they went back to them uh, to be encouraged and strengthened by them uh, through the things that they had faced. So God's Word tells us who was qualified to be a member of a local church. First of all, they've got to be saved people. We talked about that. Scripturally saved. Scripturally saved. And then they should be scripturally baptized. And that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to follow the Lord in believer's baptism, the ordinance of believer's baptism. There are three factors you should consider when you think about the subject of baptism. Number one, there's the proper authority when it comes to baptism, a proper authority. Jesus told the church in Matthew 28, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The local church is the authority scripturally to baptize. And I don't have that authority, even though I'm the pastor. The pastor, the authority to baptize does not lie in the pastor. It lies within the church. It's within the church. That's why, and I told our folks this not long ago, and they laughed, but I'm not, well, I can't go buy me a truck and, and, uh, and put, put a big billboard on the side and uh, saying uh, uh, baptisms on the run and on the go or whatever, and I just pull up somewhere and put out an inflatable pool and fill it full of water and just baptize people. I don't have any right to do that. I don't have any authority to do that. The authority lies in the local church, doesn't it? It lies in the local church. And so the local church is the only authority. There should be a proper authority. There should be a proper mode of baptism. The mode of baptism. And this is important. Why, Pastor? Because it's scriptural. It's of scriptural importance. The word baptism itself or to baptize means to place under. It means to put within and under. This is what the word is. It means, we often use the word immerse. He put under, immerse. This is what it means. And, and if we know that's what it means, then that's what we ought to do, isn't it? It's what we ought to do. It's scriptural. It's scriptural. Uh, baptism is immersion in water. Uh, in the water, under the water. It's a picture. It's supposed to give us a picture of, a, of an already present reality in that heart and life. <clears throat> Baptism is a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and of the new life that is in Christ, our Savior. It pictures that for us. And uh, immersion is the only proper mode by which that can be illustrated. I can't illustrate that any other way. When I have uh, these uh, folks tonight and uh, with Taylor, uh, I'm going uh, to say upon your profession and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Why do you say that, Pastor? I just read it. Matthew 28 said, Go you into all the world, preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's why I do it. We don't just make this stuff up. <laughs> it's scriptural. 
And then what I do is this. I'll literally say, buried with Christ in baptism. And I'm going to, I'm going to put them under the water. Raised up, raised to walk in the newness of life. This is what I'm going to do. Because that's what it's picturing. It pictures the fact that we identified with Jesus Christ on the cross. He took my sin debt there. He took my uh, uh, sins and nailed them to the cross. He shed His blood to wash away my sin. He was buried but rose again from the grave. He's victorious over death, hell, and the grave. He defeated the world. He defeated the flesh. He defeated the devil. Uh, He defeated all of my enemies. And in Christ now, I have a new life that was never possible for me before. I, I, before I was saved, I couldn't defeat the world. I couldn't stand up against the devil. I was a victim and slave to my own sinful flesh. But in Christ, I have a new life. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. That's what baptism pictures. I'm not baptizing them to be saved. They're following the Lord in baptism because they have been and they want to publicly identify with the Lord and, uh, and let everyone know now uh, what they have already had in their hearts and lives. And so there's a proper baptism mode and there's a proper candidate, someone that's born again by the grace of God. And that's what these two, these two, these two young men and women have told me. They've trusted Christ as their Savior. So, so the, 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 the local church... The local church is precious. It's precious. Your church, a local New Testament church, if you go to a Bible preaching, Bible teaching local church, like we find in the scriptures, it's a precious thing because the Lord loves it and he gave himself for it, didn't he? And he believes in the importance of it. And he wants everyone who knows Jesus Christ to be a part of that local church. And we become a part of that local assembly uh, after we have trusted Christ as our Savior, after we've Uh, after we've followed the Lord in believers' baptism. And so uh, we're thankful for membership in the local church. And and we're thankful for you. And uh, we're glad you're here tonight. We're going to get ready to change the order of our service in a moment. But we do want to have a time of prayer. And we want to just take just a moment and uh, just allow the Lord to speak to our hearts through His Word. Uh, But our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And with our heads bowed and eyes closed, there could be someone who's come to church tonight, but you'd say by... uh, uh, just a very simple raise of your hand, and I won't embarrass you, and I will not, I will not point you out in public or embarrass you, but I want to know how to pray for you, and I want to know how to proceed tonight in the service. But there could be someone by a very simple, just slipping up of your hand, just enough for me to see it. You say, Pastor, I don't know today that if I died, I would go to heaven. I do not know that I've ever, uh, I've ever received Christ as my personal Savior. I've never had anyone sit down with the Word of God and show me what Jesus Christ did for me and what it means to trust Christ and be saved. And tonight I realize that I've, I've neglected to prepare for eternity. And if I die tonight, I do not have the assurance or hope of eternal life. Maybe someone in the service tonight, you've come to church, you've come to watch Hannon and Taylor be baptized and profess publicly their faith in Christ when you know in your own heart you've never done that personally in your own heart and life. Listen, there's nothing greater in this world than to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. The Bible said, what would a man profit if he gained the whole world and lost his own soul? Or what would you give in exchange for your soul? There's nothing, nothing in this world as valuable as your soul because God gave His Son, Jesus Christ, that you might have eternal life. Maybe you're here tonight and you don't know Him as your Savior. If you'll slip your hand up and just show me by that, uh, I'll pray for you. And, and I would like to meet with you or my wife. Somebody will meet with you right after the church service. And if you'd like to slip out of your seat right now and come, we'll meet you right here. We don't want anyone to not know Christ as your personal Savior. And tonight, we just want to look to Him. Have you followed the Lord in believer's baptism? Have you trusted Jesus Christ, but you've never followed Him in believer's baptism? This is a tremendous step of growth in our Christian life. And this is something that the Lord Jesus gives us the example of in His Word. And maybe tonight you'd like to do that. I know some of you are going to be doing that in the very near future. You've told me that that's what you'd like to do. So we will. But tonight, maybe someone, anyone at all, Lord, we just pray you'll meet with every heart in life. We thank you for what you're doing tonight. We ask you, Lord, in Jesus' name, just to minister to every heart that's here. Meet each individual at the place of need and understanding in which they are. 
uh, Lord, if someone has come to church but they've never come to Christ, help them to see, Lord, that they, uh, that they are unprepared, that, Lord, uh, that at any moment, uh, Lord, uh, we, any of us, may enter eternity, and then, Lord, it will be too late. Help them not to ignore, God, this great need. Uh, Lord, help us to see that we're to be biblical people. Salvation is not my way or someone else's way. God, it's your way, and Jesus Christ is that way. The church is not to be my church or our church or this way or that, but Lord, it is your church. You've given us a pattern in the Word of God. Help us to be sure that we, uh, Lord, seek to be uh, what we can as a local New Testament church according to your Word. Bless and meet needs, speak to lives and hearts, and Lord, we just ask you in Jesus' name now uh, just to minister to everyone uh, here tonight. We ask it in your name. In Jesus' name, and amen. Why don't we just stand together for a moment? You've been seated for a while. Turn to him 310, and we're going to sing the first verse of this together. And uh, we're going to look at uh, moving forward here, but let's sing this first verse. If the Lord spoke to your heart, you need to respond to him. You come as we sing the first verse. <clears throat> Sing that second verse. All to Jesus I surrender humbly at his feet I bow. Earthly pleasures all the things do take me. Jesus take me now. I surrender. seated we're going to ask uh, Taylor and Hannon just to come and uh, I, I want to get my picture with them here tonight and I, I know that some others might like to sometime before the night's over but we're thankful for this couple I always hate for you, you stand way over he's so tall he makes me look so short I hate to get between them they uh, they're so uh, so tall and such a great family and we're thankful for them but we're honored uh, that this couple's in our church they uh, they're doing a lot and already growing, and, uh, and I'm thankful for their desire to follow the Lord in believers' baptism, and uh, I'm excited about how God's going to use them and their daughters, and, and so we're just excited and thankful for them, and uh, we're going to pray together with them, and then they're going to go and get ready, and we'll, uh, we'll do this uh, tonight in honor of the Lord, and, and so uh, let's just look to the Lord and have a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, thank you for Taylor and Hannon and their families. Thank you, God, for this couple that... Lord, are a good example of what a, uh, a God-fearing Christian young husband and wife, mother and father should be and want to be. Lord, thank you for how they're faithful to bring their children to church and, Lord, to begin to, uh, to place their children's hearts under the Word of God. And, Lord, we're praying for those little girls that they'll, at a very in, uh, early, tender age, Lord, receive you as their personal Savior and, uh, Lord, know what joy it is. Uh, to, uh, to know you and to know the peace that comes uh, from being saved. So we pray as a local church now, as this uh, couple takes uh, this step, that, Lord, we'll be a great church family for them and uh, that, Lord, we'll be there for them and we'll encourage them, we'll lift them up, we'll be faithful to be a good example and that, Lord, uh, you've given us this, this part of our body now, Lord, to help in serving you and in furthering your work in the world. So. Bless them and meet needs in their hearts and lives and in their family. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to go ahead and get ready. And we'll be out in just a moment. And Taylor, when you're done, you just open that door up, okay?
be sure you turn the breaker off to the back. Of the yeah, that, that's my concern. Is uh, we got we got the juice off there. And, uh, and, uh, I asked Nikki to take some pictures, but anyone that would like to, you can do that as well. We're going to just wait on Hannah to be sure he's ready, because I know he's wanting to see Taylor. And uh, but we are excited, thankful, and excited. Uh, it's exciting to do things that we know the true church has done for over 2,000 years, and and uh, and we're excited today to be able to see the this uh, couple do that. Again, baptism is just a demonstration, an outward picturing of what we already know has happened in our hearts and lives, and, and we're thankful that the Lord Jesus has given us that illustration, and uh, we're thankful and excited for you uh, being out here as well. Uh, Taylor, why don't you just go ahead and make your way in here, and we'll, we'll be sure it ends. It seems you first, and this can be slick, so just hold on there, okay? Be slick. Good deal. I'm going to get you to just stand right here, and Josh, I'm going to get Josh to help me a little bit. Now this heater doesn't work the best in the world, but uh, but we're not, but I was baptized in a creek. So so how many of you were baptized outside there? Amen. I was too. So so no complaints up here, right? Out of anybody? Amen. All right. I'm glad they brought the girls in. <laughs> So we're thankful today to be to do what the Lord has commanded us to do for every born again believer. So uh, Taylor, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and obedience to the Lord's command, I baptize you tonight in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Okay, just hold my arm. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. Amen. 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 Step up there just a step or two, you're good. All right, Hannah, and that can be slick right there, okay? So just watch your step. All right. Good. You're smart. You left your socks on. Well, I got there. Yeah. All right, Hannah, you come right over here. And uh, so, so we're thankful again for Hannon and. Uh, and uh, he's doing a good job. He's helping play in our orchestra and, and anything we need. He's been in the building, under the building, everywhere, helping out, doing this, that, and the other. And, and uh, one of these guys and that family, that family, both sides of the family can do anything. So we're glad and blessed for that. And uh, we're just excited and thankful for him. So handing upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and in obedience to the Lord's command, I baptize you tonight in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in the news of life. Amen. Good job. Amen. All right. Amen. These big guys, they're hard for me, aren't they? Well, it's been a blessing, hadn't it, to be here? And uh, I know they're wet and cold, but. Uh, they'll get changed and dry off just as soon as they can. And I know a lot of you are going to want to talk, speak to them and encourage them and talk to them. Uh, but these, boys, these little girls right here, I'm so excited they were here to see that. You know, we cannot leave a greater testimony for our children than our faith in Jesus Christ and our desire to follow the Lord. And so you've made a great investment right here in your children. And so we thank the Lord for that. Why don't you stand with us and we'll be dismissed today and have a word of prayer. And uh, let them stop shivering. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for being great to us. We thank you for this family. We ask you to bless them, keep your hand on them, and Lord, use them. And Lord, we just pray and thank you for the day when these little girls will trust Jesus Christ as well. And one day, God, we'll see them here and uh, right where mom and dad was. And so, Lord, help moms and dads and parents and grandparents lead the way as we obey the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name.